federal level on uh, uh, June 22nd, there will be a carbon tax rally in the District of Columbia. Of course, you probably know that uh, the uh, carbon tax of 18.3 uh, cents per gallon has just been uh, pushed along every two months or so. It's time we increase it and make it long term. Uh, and uh, one last item, uh, there has been what I consider media suppression. Of course, the public media is large corporations as well. But, uh, you know, with all this uh, rain and flooding that they've had in Houston, Texas, called the Bayou City, and, and there have been a whole bunch of deaths, 12 inches of rain in 24 hours. Uh, record, never been had that much rain before. Uh, no one has mentioned that that is also uh, climate change effects. And uh, also, uh, very little at all was said this morning of the uh, uh, protests at the uh, Chevron annual meeting today in San Ramon. Thank you. Okay, we pass next to the approval of the summary of actions. Anyone have any corrections or changes? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we move on to the annual election of chair and vice chair. I have uh, served for two years. I would prefer to serve a third. Um, Linda is not here tonight. She is our vice chair, Linda Molina. So I'm not sure what the uh, committee wants to do about that. Uh, Mr. Chair, did you mention that you would like to run for a third term? Yes. Well, I nominate Stephen Smith to serve as chair of the committee for the current year. And I second sure. that. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. We now pass to uh, <clears throat> the uh, selection of a vice chair. Does anyone wish to uh, step forward and? Uh, I'm willing to serve. Uh, that is, you want to run any pension serving? In well, I actually, I would like to nominate Yolanda. What? I would like to nominate Yolanda as vice chair. Okay, we have and one nomination. I, have, yeah, have like nominate. Do I have a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Do you accept the position? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we pass on to the uh, attendance log. There are no changes to that. Then uh, move on to the meeting calendar, which is pretty much going with our uh, standard pattern for June and July of the third Wednesday. And as is customary in the authority, there will be no meeting in August. And finally, does anyone have any changes to the their entry in the roster? Not believe all three of those accepted. 
So we move on to the review of the City of El Cerritos calendar years 2012 and 2013 growth management program compliance checklist. And we have somebody here from the City of El Cerrito. Good evening, committee. My name is Melissa Tigbell. I'm with the City of El Cerrito Public Works Department. I'm here for Yvette Ortiz, who is our department head. She was unable to make it. So I'll try my best to answer any questions that you may have. Um, as far as the compliance checklist, City of El Cerrito is in compliance. And I believe that um, getting approval here at the CAC is the first step before getting the approval of the checklist to allocate all of the funds. Members have uh, questions? Well, it's a quick question. Um, I realize that like many other communities, uh, you're kind of uh, having some challenges facing all of the um, housing element requirements. Um, do you anticipate that probably most future projects are going to also be infill? As in having issues with future projects? Well, I mean, just in terms of the, the properties available for the development of, of housing in the various categories, do you think it's probably going to be primarily infill or are there any other you know, major new projects on the horizon? We do have a couple of major <coughs> projects. Right now we have a 56 it's a, let me see. It's 57 units that are actually under construction right now, um, not too far from the El Cerrito del Norte BART station, and that's um, going to be opening in June or July. And then after that, we still have another plan for a 128 residential market price condominium, which is going to be right next to the retail center so um, we do have still a little bit of open space we also have one more location which is actually an existing building but we already have the and it's 100 percent entitled for a 63 senior affordable housing 63 units all we need is just the financing for that so there are definitely projects that are coming down the pipeline doesn't seem to be slowing down too much what is your, do you know what your projected uh, population growth is going to be over the next several years? Mm, you know, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I can get back to you. Of the units that are going in, are there any plans for affordable units? Yes. So the first one, which is 57 units that's going into construction right now called Ohlone Gardens, um, all of it is affordable housing units. Ten of those are for special needs. Mm -hmm. Then for the 128 condo apartment called Creek Sidewalk, it will be approximately 15% of those as affordable units, and that will be a number of 19, 19 units. The last one, which is the Eden Senior Housing that I was mentioning, which is an existing building, um, that's all 63 units of senior affordable housing. Melissa? Melissa, hi. Uh, I always ask this question. What does the city of El Cerrito consider affordable? I wouldn't be able to answer that. I'd have to go back to our community development department. There usually that. is a calculation based on uh, uh, medium income and I I'm sorry I don't know what that other I was just wondering if you had a ballpark some some cities consider affordable housing seven hundred thousand dollars for a home and I was just curious as to what that would be in El Cerrito. Oh I think it would be much lower. Um, I can get back to you. Unfortunately, I don't have that information. By the way, I'm very impressed with your report. Thank you. I, I think that you, uh, you have a very strong commitment 
to ensuring that there's housing for your citizens in your community. And while it's difficult to project what your growth rate is going to be, I think that you have an eye on that when you would be the particular housing that you've put up. So thank you. Thank you. Is it possible that you could expand a little bit on the uh, the housing I mean, the job opportunities. The job uh, opportunities. Types of jobs, you know. At these locations. Yes. Um. You know, not with the information that they gave me. Like I said, I was I'm just filling in for our department head, but I can definitely get back to you and let you know what kind of jobs would be expected. Any further questions on the part of the members of the committee? Uh, so I wanted to make one more question. So you mentioned that these units are infill units. They're not like expansions of the city? Well, they are expansions in the sense where there is the property is there. It's vacant lots. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so then um, you're going off him, going off his questions about um, – Increasing your um, uh, the, uh, the the companies that are there, are there going to be any growth in like um, commercial areas or any additional um, yeah any additional commercial areas around in that area? Because you know one thing that I know the um, Greenbelt Alliance always likes to look out for is um, us focusing on the um, walkable cities. And continued, uh, you know, yeah, just walkable cities, <clears throat> and making sure that all of the residential areas are right next to the commercial areas, and trying to keep, you know, cars off the road. So I'm wondering, are you guys keeping that in mind, or, or maybe expanding public transportation to these new areas, or since it's not infill? Um, actually, back in September of 2014, um, our city adopted the San Pablo Avenue specific plan, and it's basically a transit-oriented plan to um, that offers both transit-oriented higher-intensity mixed-use and medium-intensity mixed-use, and it also is allowing, um, you know, more businesses to come in with and more more housing uh, housing to come in at higher higher levels to increase the density. So like 65 feet um, within a half a mile of the BART station is what we would allow for um, developers. And then a little bit farther from the BART stations, it would go down to 55 feet. We've removed things like parking requirements. Um, we're also working on an active transportation plan, which is going to be adopted probably in the fall. And that's going to be working on creating a more complete street for San Pablo Avenue, which would include facilities for bicycles, pedestrians, parking, bikes, and transit. So we've been working with both Caltrans, AC Transit, and all of the other um, committees and commissions that deal with San Pablo Avenue. And I have some handouts for our specific plan if anybody's interested. I'm just curious, <clears throat> how much open space is left in El Cerrito and also on the old structures and old buildings, whether they're retail or old city-owned properties, <clears throat> what are your uh, long-term plans for redeveloping that? I think one of the larger projects is the Eden Senior Housing. That's in our long-term plan, is to try to get that developed. Um, we do have open space, which is um, comprised of our parks and our hillside natural area. Other than that, I think that the Eden is probably the biggest project that we have for development. We do have another large commercial area, which is the former Ace Hardware. Or, or orchard, I can't remember if it's Ace or Orchard, but um, 
that has been in, on the minds of a lot of different developers coming towards this, coming to the city. You're involved with and impacted by the uh, I-80 Integrated Corridor Management Project? Yes. We How have, that, um, how's that going for you? So far it's okay. We have a couple of items, a couple of um, IMS signs along San Pablo Avenue. Um, all of our ramps already have all the signal equipment and the signal hardware. So I believe they're wrapping up. Thank you. Any further questions by members of the committee? We do not have a representative from El Cerrito at this point, a committee member. So if somebody wants to uh, make the motion. I move that we accept their uh, compliance checklist. I'll second, second that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Pass on to uh, presentation on the current status of the transportation expenditure plan, which is, as I understand it, moving right along. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Smith. Committee members, my name is Ross Chittenden. I'm a Deputy Executive Director for Projects here at the Authority, and I appreciate you uh, inviting me in for this discussion. It's an exciting time at the, at the Authority, and I uh, uh, hope after I have a chance to chat about it with you guys today, you'll see that it's an exciting time, and you'll uh, join in and help us as we go down this path. Um, I'm going to have, I have a presentation that I'd, I'd like to walk through. I walked uh, our board through this the other night, and uh, I've done this at a few of the regional transportation planning committees. Um, and um, with the chair's permission, I'd like to provide some additional handouts. These are some staff reports from our meeting on, on Wednesday with Lindsay, Lindsay, if you could help me. Weave these in as part of the, uh, the presentation here tonight. Um, as I'm sure you've heard over the last year or so, uh, whether it's at a, one of our board meetings or a RTPC meeting or potentially as uh, discussions that you've had here at this committee meeting related to the countywide transportation plan, um, the authority has been uh, assessing our, our needs countywide, uh, our transportation needs countywide. And uh, um, we've been, as we've done that, we've tried to look at how far Measure J is going to carry us, Measure C, Measure J. And what we've seen is a very significant uh, gap in the anticipated revenues coming into the county and, and what we've identified as the needs. Um, if you sum up the entire value of the needs as, as documented in the countywide transportation plan and compare it against the uh, anticipated revenue. And this would be revenue we raise locally, uh, revenue we get from the state or federal government, and then we get a lot of funding out of MTC, regional funding. That gap over the next 25 years is $13 billion. So we're facing a decision. So. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is a uh, uh, direction that our board at the authority gave to staff to start discussion and development of what we would refer to as a transportation sales tax and what I'll be talking about is a transportation expenditure plan. Um, and this is uh, a plan that could potentially go to the ballot as early as November of 2016. So we have, have some time. Uh, um, so a couple of key points that I'd like to make before I dive into my presentation. Um, this is development of a plan and development of consensus to see if there is consensus to move forward to a ballot, um, possible ballot measure. 
uh, that is clearly uh, not a declaration by the authority that we are definitively going to the ballot measure. I want to make sure that everybody walks away with that understanding. This is a development of a plan, development of uh, you know, working through stakeholder outreach, development of consensus, and only if we collectively decide this is something that we'd like to put before the voters will that decision be made. And that decision would be made, and you'll see as I walk through my presentation, very collaboratively with a wide variety of stakeholders. Ultimately, we would need the approval of, of the authority board here, um, would need the approval of the majority of the cities in the county, and ultimately the board of supervisors. So this is not something we're going to take lightly. It's not something we can do in this boardroom without a lot of involvement. So this is really just the beginning of a dialogue to see where we're, where we're going. So to know where we're going or where we want to go, it's often good to learn from what we've done. So I just, uh, hopefully what I'm showing on these next slides are things you're familiar with, but uh, as I get out and talk about this, I, I find a lot of the folks I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to really don't have a lot of background of you know, the authority and who we are. In many, many cases, even Measure C and Measure J. So, so I always want to make sure that we put a little context into this discussion. So as I'm sure you all know, the authority was created in 1988 with the passage of Measure C. Um, that was a half a cent sales tax enacted for 20 years, 1988 through 2009. If you do the math, that's 20 years. And uh, actually, it was 1989 to 2009, so it was 20 years. And uh, uh, interesting, uh, Contra Costa was the second county in the state to take this method on as a way to raise revenue for, for transportation. Santa Clara County was the first county. And in fact, Bob McCleary worked at Santa Clara County when the, that measure was passed. So when he came up here, that was part of his charge uh, uh, working here in Contra Costa. Um, measure C was a program that, that came on the heels of, of, of lack of funding out of the state and out of the federal government for transportation. So we were a county that was growing rapidly, a suburban county growing rapidly, and our infrastructure could not serve the needs of, of the residents that lived here or those moving in and businesses moving in. Measure C was, um, I'd say it was project intensive. So the, the majority of the funding was for large projects like BART extension out to Bay Point, um, adding lanes to 242, adding lanes on, on 680 and, and elsewhere, the Richmond Parkway. So it was a lot of infrastructure. Um, but it did have funding for uh, pothole repair. It did have funding for paratransit and, and bus service. Uh, but the need back then really was towards com completing our infrastructure. Um, seeing that Measure C was uh, coming to a sunset, in 2004, the voters in Contra Costa endorsed a ballot measure, Measure J, that extended that half a cent sales tax for a half a year, um, or half a year for 25 years. Um, and uh, that the couple of couple of differences, one in the, one with the term is a little longer, 25 years was a little longer. Uh, but the, the real major difference in, in Measure J was our infrastructure was starting to get built. It wasn't complete. You know, so Measure J included things like Caldecott, um, widening Highway 4 out in Antioch, Pittsburgh, um, and, and out in Brentwood, uh, the, the EBART extension out in that direction. Uh, there were some projects in there. About 40% of the revenue was available for projects. The other 60% for, were for what we call programs. So that's part of the subject of the last discussion and, uh, you know, the, the return to source funding. Again, bus, paratransit. We added a transportation for livable communities program. So, so some new programs popped up. So about 40% projects, 60% programs. Um, one of the other decisions that were made uh, uh, upon the passage of Measure J was because we still had some infrastructure needs and, and you know, less funding than out of Measure C, our board made a decision that we could bond against that 40% revenue. So, so that's a significant decision that I'll, I'll talk about in, in a few moments. Um, 
you put that all together, some of the added programs and Measure J and, and our role as a congestion management agency, you'll see that we provide a wide variety of transportation solutions to the, the residents here in Contra Costa. We're not a highway department, we're not a transit agency, we're, you know, we're not the park district building trails. We, we do it all, or at least we fund it all. Um, so, so this is uh, something that, that Lindsay and her team came up with. I think it's very nice that summarizes and has some nice little icons that show the different uh, types of transportation that, that, that we fund through our, our programs. And in some cases we implement, and most cases or many cases it's done by the local jurisdictions or BART, park district, et cetera. So it's a very collaborative process to deliver uh, very uh, uh, multimodal solutions to the to the public here. Um, so that's really set in the whole context. The, the next series of slides, I really want to focus on that 40% that I mentioned a few minutes ago that's available for projects. So uh, number one, <laughs> uh, timing couldn't have been better. Passion, passion Measure J, when, when we passed it, there were we didn't know it at the time it passed, but there were some funding opportunities on the horizon. Um, uh, Prop 1B out of the state, the Recovery Act out of the federal government. So not knowing where the money is coming from, but wanting to be ready, we have the mantra of getting projects shovel ready. So we'll start the environmental work, in some cases the design work for projects, even if they're not fully funded, because every once in a while, a bucket of money does fall out of the sky and you want to be ready. I talked a little bit about the next two bullets, the finance and, and bonding against future revenue. And again, that was a strategic policy decision made by the authority, um, knowing that the residents uh, didn't want to wait 25 years for those improvements. So we wanted to find a way to advance them and, and deliver them as soon as possible. Um, maintain great relationships with your funding partners. That, that I think, is... Uh, a uh, shift that's happened over the last five years or so since uh, my boss Randy Iwasaki came in town. Uh, uh, we, we've established a great relationship, I believe, with MTC. They've, they've helped out tremendously on funding projects. Um, anybody that thinks they can do it alone is a fool. So building partnerships and, and relationships is very, very important. And if you do all that, you can do the last bullet there is Leverage other people's money. We, we love it when we uh, are able to compete uh, for project funding and uh, obtain that funding. Uh, next couple of slides, are trying to show you that graphically. Um, on this slide here, this is our annual sales tax revenue. Well, that's actually our budget. I'll, I'll say it's our budget sliced uh, uh, in two components. So the blue bar is the annual sales tax collected here in Contra Costa. So I'm starting that in 2010. So uh, uh, that's kind of at the bottom of the recession. So you've seen there's been a fairly steady growth, um, averaging about 5% over the last several years. So nice increase in funding. The red bar is what I really want to want to point you at. Uh, that's funding in our budget that's leveraged uh, from other sources. So that's state, federal, regional sources. And you can see using that strategy I just talked about, we've been very successful in attracting other funds. Overall, if what, you look at I'm, the, I'm sorry, what happened to the uh, 2015 where the, the red bar kind of dropped by 20 million? So what's happening there is Caldecott's finishing, um, Highway 4 is starting to finish, um, uh, EBART, you know, so it's, it's You'll see the project, we're winding down the program. That's going to be the big crescendo when I work through this uh, series of, uh, of slides here. Um, overall, if you look at Measure J, the, the entire capital program, the capital side is about $2.5 billion. So if we can complete it uh, by leveraging money, we'll have the blue section, about 25% will be Measure J. We've already leveraged about two-thirds to complete that. We're still working on that green piece. So you can just see, you know, the, the sales tax allow us to compete and attract a lot of other funds. So this is really getting to your question. So what I've shown here is what we're calling, we call it, you know, there's two ways to look at it. There's the half full way and the half empty way. The, the, the half empty way is this is our fiscal cliff. 
The half full way is the title of the slide, 25 and 10. Um, we've completed our 25 year capital program in Measure J in 10 years. So that top line is our total revenue collected annually, so, you, so that's that increase, that's part inflation, that's part economic growth. The lower blue line, that's, that's uh, the 40% that's available for projects and, and what we can bond against. So what we've done, is there a pointer here? Check it out. So by bonding, we've taken this funding, that, that future funding, and created this expenditure peak here. So this is our actual spending. So you can see, you know, we've delivered these projects much, much earlier um, by advancing these dollars, but what it does is, you know, where, where's our future? Do we want, do we have a future program? That do we, are there still needs that we need to consider? So this picture is really why we discussed, we started the discussion about uh, the need, or I shouldn't say the need, but the potential for uh, uh, going back to the voters and seeing if, if they have an additional appetite for, for more uh, revenue for, for transportation purposes. So, and actually, let me, uh, so before I jump to that, I should say, we, we actually did kind of consi consider other, you know, just consider the, the landscape. So what this, uh, this slide does is it, it really shows you transportation funding overall in California. Um, so as you can see here, that green slice 65% of the funding in transportation in California is locally derived. So that's either through sales tax or through, in, in the Bay Area, you know, we have the toll bridges, so, so a lot of tolls. Uh, the state kicks in a little over 20%. The feds, the feds used to fund the program at about 80%. I'm, I've been around a long time. I used to work at Caltrans. I remember the days where projects were 80% federal funding and you had to put in your 20% local match. Well, that's, that's flipped. So, uh, um, and you've probably either seen in the paper, or you've followed the discussions either in Sacramento or in Washington. In Washington, uh, they, they, can't, they can't resolve the funding crisis. Uh, transportation uh, trust fund is on the brink of insolvency. Um, they recently, the, the, the Congress recently uh, uh, enacted an extension to the federal bill. Um, it's, it's, everybody's kind of thrown up their hands in Washington. They don't know how they're going to fix that. They're looking at a variety of primarily tax reform, uh, I don't want to say gimmicks, that's not a good word, tax reform uh, uh, measures to try to uh, come up with revenue, but increasing the gas tax is, is dead. There's been a number of, of the leading members of Congress that have said that there just isn't a will. Sacramento, uh, I feel a little more confident about Sacramento. Uh, Assemblymember Frazier is a, a, among a handful of uh, Democrats that are talking about a series of, of fees and, and tax increases. Um, Senator Bell from the Silicon Valley area, he in, introduced a bill um, that would generate about $3 billion a year, but he sunset it in five years. Um, and uh, it, I think it's aimed at the right place. About a half of it would go to the state for maintenance and operations of the highway system. About 45% would return to, to your jurisdictions for pothole money, and then there would be 5% that would be incentives for agencies that would uh, uh, generate local local funds. So Sacramento, I feel a little bit better that something may happen in Sacramento, but if Senator Bell's bill goes through, um, that's a five-year limited term, and we're back to seeing this kind of picture again in five years. So these local taxes are just very, very important. We're a member of what we call Self-Help County Coalition. So there are 20 counties throughout California that have elected to tax themselves. And I, and I should say, I, I should have said earlier, uh, special tax like this is a two-thirds supermajority to pass. So, so it's a very high bar to pass. I mean, you've got 20% of the people that are going to say no to anything. So you, you really have to be spot on to get one of these measures through. But 20 counties have done it. Many of them, like us, have done it more than one time. And overall, we generate $4 billion uh, throughout California. And again, that's most of the self-help counties are similar to us in that they, 
They invest in a variety of highway projects, you know, major arterial projects, bus operations, new buses, uh, paratransit, and so forth. So one of the things I think that's great about the South Hope County movement is we fund a very diverse program where the feds and the state, a lot of times their money is really siloed. We, we try to meet the needs of, of many people throughout California or throughout Contra Costa. So thinking about, about all this, as we were doing public outreach as part of the countywide transportation plan, we thought we'd ask the voter or ask uh, participants in the poll, and this was a telephone poll, telephone survey, do they believe that additional funding is needed for transportation? And that question's always asked in these kind of polls, and you get very, very similar results. Three quarters of the people say, Heck yeah, we need to spend more money on transportation. It's when you get to the next question, how are we going to pay for it? I you start getting into the single digits and you know the, the low teens on support for different initiatives. Well, because of the success of local uh, these local measures and, and us like uh, all, all the self help counties, we kind of have a mantra: promises made, promises kept. So we're accountable to the electorate that have uh, voted to. Uh, provide us with revenue to invest, we had 68% of the respondents that said they would be willing to increase and extend the local sales tax measure. So I, I, earlier I said that's what gave the, that the fiscal cliff charts would gave our board impetus to talk about uh, this topic, and that's actually wrong. It's, it's this result here. Putting it all together, folks know that we've had great success with the programs and the call to cut tunnel and things like that, um, they're, they're, they're willing to, to uh, invest more uh, according to this uh, statistic here. And 68% is pretty much right on the number. If that was the result of the vote, it would pass. If we lose uh, 2%, then, then we wouldn't, wouldn't make it. It's Alameda County, as I'm sure you know, in 2012, they lost by uh, 700 votes out of 700,000 votes cast. So this... Uh, very, very narrow margin of error as we're talking to the, the voters about Qu that. Question here. Uh, what was the size of the, the sample size of that survey and what was the margin of error? I think it was, there were two surveys, 800 each. Yeah, so we actually did two surveys. Um, uh, they were both about 800 each. And uh, the second one, you know, our board didn't believe, no, I shouldn't say our board didn't believe it. They, you know, this was uh, about 14 months ago, so the economy was just starting to recover. You know, would people be ready to open up their wallet? So, showed on the results, and they go, "Well, yeah, let's let's go back and do another one." So the 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 second one we did a, a split, and um, and, and the, one of them had the word "new tax" in it, and and the other talked about, you know, uh, I forgot exactly how it was word increase. And you put a new tax in it, we lost about 2%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to be very, uh, very, uh, you want to be up front with the voters. Um, you want to make sure we give them credible information and, and we help educate them. Um, but uh, sometimes the words matter. So, Chair, I was going to take a, a little pause here, grab a sip and, uh, and enter, to, you know, entertain any questions about how we got to the point where we actually want to start talking about a transportation plan. And I'll take a sip of water. And if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer those. I, I just want to ask one question about uh, the outreach. You said the outreach was by phone? Just for this particular poll, yes. Because oftentimes I find um, when I talk to citizens uh, from Antioch, um, only a certain percentage of citizens are involved in surveys, so it's yeah. not a good cross section of voters to, to, to get a real true feeling about, you know, how they really feel about the taxes. The other thing that I find is that um, a large number of people are uneducated about why they're being taxed. Yes. And I would think if the outreach was more comprehensive, and not only more comprehensive, but, you know, uh, broken down in terms that uh, some of the residents could really understand. Mm -hmm. Because transportation in Antioch, for those who can't afford cars, or for those who understand the validity of not having so many vehicles right. on the road, 
uh, I, I think that we would fare a lot better. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've been trying to do and working with some other, with other citizens to do is to try to start getting the word out. You know, but in order to do that, um, we have to have better information. And before I became part of this group, uh, I didn't get the information that I'm getting now. Yeah. And I'm a homeowner. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think there's two comments there. Let me try to address each of those. So, um, here you can see that we did break the the responses down by region and the county. And I can't see that far in blue as strongly and agree to, you know, generally agree. Um, and uh, so, so we, we had a professional pollster uh, administer the poll for us. And what they did is look at, um, you know, based on history, voters who are most likely uh, you would expect to vote in the 2016 election. So, so most of these types of measures go to a major, uh, major election. Um, so to receive a phone call in this poll, you had to be – registered to vote, and you had to have a preponderance for, for voting in major elections. So, you know, uh, you have your kind of stable voters, they'll go out to any election, and, and, you know, you know what the results are for some of those elections where you're only getting 40 percent of the folks that vote. So a major presidential election where you uh, will be electing a new president, you know, you're going to have a very relatively high for, you know, America, you're going to have a high voter turnout. So they, 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 they went through and they didn't select individuals, but they selected, you know, the, the traits uh, and, and, and screened through voting records and public information to, to come up with uh, a, a random group of people that had uh, the criteria that said they're likely to vote in 2016. So, so it was really targeted. Uh, not targeted to, you know, political party or anything like that, but targeted to people who are likely to vote. Um, and your second question, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, transportation is uh, it's, it's, uh, ubiquitous, and everybody relies on it. But how it happens is, is a mystery, and how it's funded is a mystery. Um, so I'll take what you said on as a challenge. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the outreach we, we, we did in the countywide transportation plan. And, uh, and one of the reasons Lindsay's here, and this is Lindsay Willis. I, I don't know if you guys do introductions. I'm sorry I missed the introduction. So you've seen Lindsay here often. And so she, part, one of the reasons she's here is she wants to hear some of your comments because she'll be working with our consultant team and, and I to develop an outreach plan because, you know, we, we know we need to provide credible information and, and just let the chips fall where they may. We're not going to be steering this one way or the other. We just want to present the, the, the voters with a choice and, and um, educate them to w what that choice means. Um, and, uh, you know, this is America. I, I don't know about the supermajority, but we live with that. So uh, democracy in this, this uh, world is, is two-thirds, and um, we want to make sure we have an educated electorate. Um, and uh, you know, we'll be doing additional rounds of poll before we, we make that decision. We're not going to just rush out and, and, and uh, you know, if we get feedback that, that says that 68% isn't going to hold with what you guys are talking about, then we know we'll need to regroup. We're not going to – we're, we're – we're, uh, if we make the decision to go to the ballot, we're in it to win it. And, uh, uh, you know, we're not going to do that unless we believe that we've – educated folks well enough so that uh, based on what they know, they would support this. Well, I want you to take something else back with you. Okay. And, you know, by no means what I'm saying, it's not a criticism. No, I, I, because I, I want to commend you, first yeah. of all. Um, you. I think you guys have been doing a, a fantastic job in most areas. Um, I personally would like to see um, some, some opportunities that I think are right there that just haven't been created in training and employment. Mm -hmm. That's another subject. But I think you brought up something very important, and it, it was right along with my point. There's a major election coming up for president, which means a lot of new voters will be coming out, um, given who uh, folks think will be running for those offices. So I think that it's a good opportunity for transportation to educate more people, and I think uh, um, looking at more innovative ways. Mm -hmm. uh, 
finding ways to uh, incorporate it into what young people are learning in school. It's a, it's a fantastic time. So, I mean, um, I'm in agreement with most of what, what I hear. I would just like to see it expanded. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see it expanded countywide and, 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 and in Antioch, uh, as I've said uh, in the past, uh, where I think it's a dire need mm -hmm. for education and opportunity both. So Yeah, that might be a good topic for a future meeting. I think we're doing some things that are targeted towards the youth, and so we could – we could use some more help doing that. So, anyway, um, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll move yeah, on. And I, I, I sure. do. Just notwithstanding a federal continuing resolution or a stale budget or a cut in budgets, I've noticed something. There is a strong, strong push in the national lab systems to move towards uh, a high tech research. Um, uh, addressing global warming, water production, mm -hmm. desalinization technologies, and battery technologies. Mm -hmm. um, we just opened up the Chu Center at Berkeley Lab, which is uh, totally devoted to all of those things. And so more money is being devoted towards those research projects, and they kind of dovetail into this. And I'm wondering um, how that could affect your ability to get funding from similar sources. I have to check. Randy, are you listening? <laughs> I don't know if you were here last month and Randy did his presentation. Yeah, so so this is your comments right up where we are, uh, what, what we're about now. You know, we're, we're uh, 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 transportation is at least two decades behind in the use of technology. And um, we think that you know, it's happening all over the place. And, and we're thinking, why not happen? Here, um, uh, you know, you heard from Randy. It's the, there's all the benefits, uh, the environmental benefits, and the mobility benefits, and the jobs benefits. That can happen right here. It's starting to happen with what you're talking about. So, um, we, uh, you know, we want to hear, hear hear from the public. Um, and in fact, um, in a couple of weeks, uh, the same folks that conducted this poll for us, they're going to do a series of focus groups throughout the county to try to help people in these focus groups help us or have put people in these focus groups help us talk about technology in, in a way that the public can understand. Um, back to your comment, transportation is hard enough, then you start talking about how, how technology will be used in transportation. You know, it could be anything. A lot of people are thinking it's people texting on their phone, and that's not what we're talking about. So we're, we want to... And we, we see this moment, this opportunity. We see the start of it here. We see a lot of momentum. Um, I, I'm, I, I, I guess I get to vote. I'd personally like to see some funding in here um, that's uh, earmarked for technology, but it's not necessarily uh, anything specific. Because if we if we pass a 25-year plan and we think we know what 25 years is going to look like, that's another one place where we're just fooling ourselves. So. Um, that's a, that's a tough line to have. You know, we want to commit that we're going to do these specific programs, um, but not having some funding for technology and innovation. Um, you know, we may have a missed opportunity there. How many, sorry, how many jobs are created per billion dollars? I thought I heard something like eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand. Yeah. According to the California and those Business Roundtable. Generally, round ten table. or twenty year jobs. No, no, th that's that's. Um, that number, there's all kinds of numbers bouncing around. That number, and I actually was part of the study that did that when I worked at Caltrans, that number is based on the construction inspection. Or I'm not construction inspection, the construction investment. So it doesn't have all the upfront engineering. So it's construction jobs, it's supplier jobs, it's jobs at McDonald's where the construction workers work. So, yeah, it's 18,000 about... Um, if I remember the numbers right, about 11,000 are really construction jobs, and the rest are, are uh, uh, you know, support type type of, of jobs, and, and a huge amount of economic activity. But that's a temporary benefit. When that construction job goes away, that that uh, or a construction project goes away, that job goes away, or a job goes elsewhere. You know, hopefully, the the man or woman working can follow the work around. What we want to do is combine that investment with other initiatives so that we're creating permanent jobs. Well, I don't know. 
know how you do business here. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm part of East, and um, we do have a great need. I see our number is the highest there. Um, I would like to know if we do put this on the ballot uh, and it, we support it, uh, what will be the effect of getting State Route 239 shovel ready? <laughs> that... Um I'll answer it, and then I'll, I'll, I still have some more that I want to talk about, and that will explain my answer. That really is up to the will of the, the people, you know. So, so these, this investment plan that, that you know, I'll be talking about, we don't have a secret file in our office anywhere that says we want to do this, that, or the, the other thing. So um, I'm going to say that that question of, of if and when will be, uh, part of our stakeholder outreach. So if I don't answer your question sufficiently, can you ask me again? Sure. Ross, I appreciate everything that you're doing and the intention of all this to really help, um, you know, the county's transportation plan, but I'm a little concerned about the timing mm -hmm. because, and I'm glad that Grace Kronick and the BART GM is going to be uh, presenting to us uh, in September because I know BART is contemplating a uh, revenue measure uh, on the same ballot. And then beyond that, for example, I read recently that the city of Lafayette is considering a measure. I, be, I was on the co-chair of a committee that uh, helped get a $20 million road and drain bond approved in Arenda last June, but that's nowhere near enough, so yeah. we're thinking about going back. Right. And I'm just really concerned about, um, you know, especially voters who may not fully understand or appreciate the situation both, um, you know, locally re and regionally, um, that they're going to see all these, perhaps in their minds, competing measures and decide not to vote for any of them. Yes. And I'm just kind of curious as to, um, you know, what you propose and, you know, frankly, what, what we can do as an advisory committee yeah. to help um, help people better understand the importance of all of these measures. Yeah, well, there, there's quite a longer list than what, what you provided there. So, so BART, you know, you know, is talking. AC Transit is talking as well. Um, we're trying to get a hand, you know, lay of the land, and a lot of this may not be known until the last minute of the number of jurisdictions that may be on the ballot. Um, up to nine counties in Northern California are talking about this. Um, MTC was talking about either Regional Measure 3 or Regional Gas Tax, but it sounds like they pushed that back to 2018 now. They were looking at 2016. So there, number one, there could just be voter fatigue well, there's a number of things. Voter fatigue, um, the length of the ballot is so long. An interesting thing about Alameda in 2012, um, if, if the number of people who voted for Obama had all, uh, uh, and did not vote on their measure had actually voted as everybody else had voted for Obama, they would have passed. But they were just so far down, people just stopped you know, checking the box because the, the ballot was too long. So um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that Grace is coming over. Um, there's other avenues where, where uh, um, we need to get together. There's, there's been discussions with a couple of the, the bar directors. Um, I, I don't know if they're serious or just interesting gestures about things that they'll do if, if we support them or put a lot of funding in, in our measure for them. Um, but. Uh, you know, the voters need to see that this is a coordinated plan, not competing plans. So BART could be fairly easy, in, in my opinion, because if we want more service here, they have a core capacity issue that needs to be addressed. It just flat out needs to be addressed. If we want a greater frequency or longer trains, they can't do it right now. So, so if we can help them, they can help us. We might get more service out of it, so so we have to work together. So those discussions are happening, um, and we're not sitting down, you know, comparing notes yet because neither of us are at a point where we have that definitive of a plan yet. But but we are aware of everything you're talking about. We will be talking. Hey, uh, Chair, I'm going to move on. I don't know, Ralph, you had a question. So Assemblymember Frazier has a bill, and I can't remember the number, um, that is to uh, proposes to reduce the threshold down to 55%. Uh, 
Um, now, there's uh, two words you can say that, that, that'll express my opinion about the likelihood of that happening. To change to two thirds, you have to amend Prop 13. So take that to the, to the voters and see how successful you're gonna be. I, I, I don't wanna, I, I generally try to be upbeat uh, on that one. <laughs> I have a, a real hard time if you start talking. I mean, Prop 13 is, is really the third rail in California, so. I, I don't know what the likelihood is, but Frazier has introduced a bill and they're they're debating it and uh, and that would put it on a ballot. So we'd be, have another thing on the ballot. Um, so I'm gonna move on. I appreciate the questions and if I didn't answer your questions, uh, let, let's come back. So what I really wanna talk about now is if is, is, is what we're gonna do to d develop a plan um, that, that will uh, uh, collaborate with our stakeholders and potentially take to the voters. So. What are we gonna do? The first thing we're gonna do is learn from what we, we now know through the kind of wide transportation plan process. So uh, this is kind of small in your, in, your, um, in your slides here. So there is a separate uh, uh, document in your, your packet there that has this. It's a very nice two page uh, summary. On, on this side with the, the six boxes, these are the six top priorities that we heard it, through the public engagement. Um, so it's expanded and improved BART. You know, we've, discussion we just had, potholes, people love, people hate potholes, so they love to see them fixed. Um, encourage alternatives, uh, smooth traffic, that gets to the technology. And uh, people are, want us to respect the environment while, while we do that. Um, and, and how we got that, this again, I have to give great kudos to Lindsay and her team. We had this, this, this side of the sheet uh, summarizes our, our uh, uh, tools that we use for the, the public participation. We had the old fashioned in-house workshops. So we had 156 people take their evening off or our Saturday afternoon off and come in and, and talk with us about, about the plan. Um, Lindsay and her team developed a very nice online tool that we're gonna continue working with through, through this process. Um, we did paper di distribution, um, so this was Tar paper surveys were, were targeted at, at, at folks with uh, uh, either with disabilities or those that may not have access to a computer. So we, again, we're trying to reach everybody. But a real cool thing we did was a telephone town hall uh, where we had at one point in time, we had 4,000 people online uh, dialed in, is that right? Well, we had 4,000 people who didn't hang up on us immediately. So, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, if I got that call, I'd probably hang on. But we had, you know, 1,300 people that participated. So this was like a, a little radio uh, talk show. So, so we had one of our communication consultants moderate it. And it was Randy and Martin Engelman were responding to questions from the voters. I was uh, one of the screeners, you know, you know while we answered that question or... You know, here's somebody, here's, there's a question so they get ready for it. So it was a lot of fun, but, but we had more participation in that one phone call than we ever have in every meeting that we've had in the 25 years that, that, that we've existed. So um, we're, we're into social media, we're into technology as a way of communicating with the, with the residents. So we'll build on both what we heard as our priorities and, and, and we have an interested group of folks, so we want to keep them interested through this process. Um, so again, what are the elements? I already talked about you know, building on the countywide transportation plan. And then the, the elements that go into a transportation expenditure plan, um, the, uh, can't read. So, um, here we have a couple of handouts. So we, we developed the, the principles for development of a transportation plan. That's one of the documents I distributed to the dais here. If you look at that, that's uh, and your resident of Contra Costa. If you, you start reading that, that's kind of motherhood and apple pie, things that are in our DNA about collaborative planning, um, uh, adherence to growth management plan, um, an open, uh, a transparent, participative process. So So, uh, hopefully, as you read those principles, you, you, you see these are folks that I'd like to uh, uh, talk with. Um, we need an amount and a term. So 
uh, as a starting point, and we may end up changing this, the, the, our board said for, for starts, let's, let's look at what a, a new 25-year half-cent sales tax would bring in. So this would be a, you know, if we went to the ballot in 2016, this would start in uh, the spring of 2017, and 25 years would bring in about 2.3 billion in current dollars, and of course more dollars as you escalate that out. Um, we're going to identify the projects and programs. This is part of the promises made, promises kept. We are the success of the local sales taxes are we tell the people what they're going to get for their money. Um, the state and the feds, they don't do that. It goes into a program, and uh, you hope that your priorities are taken, taken uh, care of. Other competing priorities, thank you. I think we've already covered that. And uh, there's a whole host of other policy considerations, and, and that gets into uh, growth management program. It gets into, you know, by law, the plan has to adhere to SB 375. So, so we need to make sure we're addressing uh, those needs, a uh, big focus now for underserved and underprivileged communities. So, so those, those will all be discussion as we go through the process. Um, I'm going to go to the schedule here, and you can look at these bullets. that uh, I, I like pictures, and I see I have an outdated version. Um, is, do you know if this is the version that was in the handout? Could it? Could it? In the packet, I actually have a packet. I, I'm working off. We, we, I revised this a number of times. So I apologize. I just want. Yep. Yeah, okay. So you're looking at this slide. Um, we'll be developing the plan really in a and I'm calling four waves of, of engagement with stakeholders. So this period of time up here, uh, this is this is where we are now. Uh, so we're doing the rounds with the regional transportation planning committees. We've actually started that process. Um, using this this revenue that I just talked about, we divided that by the four pieces based on population and gave each of the RTPCs a target. Um, so they're working through their priorities for projects and programs, doing this in conjunction with uh, a response that, that we all need to do to MTC on the regional, the 2017 regional transportation plan. So timing works out well. We need to talk about priorities for regional transportation plan with MTC, the, the transportation expenditure plan tells us, well, if we have additional revenue above that, what would our priorities be? So timing works well. We're going through the RTPCs. We're in the, pro well, actually at the board meeting last week, we formed what we're calling an expenditure plan advisory committee. This is a, a, a method that we've used in the past and many other counties have used it. Uh, these are primarily non-governmental organizations. Um, we're, we're, we're getting a cross-representative group of folks from different perspectives. So we'll have folks representing construction industry, folks representing labor. We'll have folks representing you know, environmental concerns, social justice concerns, health, youth, uh, religious advocates, uh, paratransit folks, trying to get people together who are all going to say, I want everything, <laughs> and knowing that you know, this doesn't get us everything. What's a compromise that uh, they can live with, you know, from their perspectives and something that we believe would be palatable uh, to, to put out to the voters. Um, and then we have, oh, oops, went too far. Wrong button. Then we have uh, other advisory committees, and that, that includes you. So uh, this, this these series of bars up here have a, have a number of milestones in there. Um, we're asking the, the regional committees to give us their priorities in, in uh, late July, early August. We'll, the staff will probably spend the month of August compiling that, something that we may ask you guys to, to look at and, and comment on. Um, the, the, the EPAC, the, the Expenditure Plan Advisory Committee, they're going to be doing kind of a parallel process, and you know, we'll share the, the results from the RTPCs with them as well. <coughs> so uh, I think that, uh, you know, with, with your concurrence throughout this process we'll, we'll probably come and share some of those results with you a few times and try to get your, your comments on them. Um, here in, in uh, um, late in the year, in November or so, we're going to release what we're calling a discussion draft. So that's the first time that we actually see is, is 239 in, 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 the, in the plan, um, you know, based on the input that, that we get from, from the stakeholders up here. 
Um, then we'll spend a couple of months working through the same stakeholders, the RTPCs, EPAC, uh, direct public. Actually, I should talk about we have direct public engagement up here as well. We want to continue uh, with the, uh, the direct public engagement. Lindsay and her team are, are building some nice tools to get direct public input. So we'll, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll work back through reconcile the, the various versions, uh, administrative changes, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the goal is that in January, our board adopts what we're calling a draft uh, uh, final TEP. And uh, then we'll go through another few months of reconciliation. Ultimately, in May, we need to get to the point, and this is actually working backwards from election day, to, to get there on election day in May, we need to have the final plan uh, that, that is nailed down, projects, programs, policies, uh, written into an ordinance. And then we'll circulate it with the county and the city. So we need the county to approve and the majority of the cities representing a majority of the population to be successful. We need 100% um, to, to meet this kind of a threshold. And it isn't until all that's wrapped up in July is really the decision made, are we going to go to the ballot? So we have uh, about 14 months or so. Um, hopefully you agree this is a collaborative process. Um, you know, we're really going to be, you know, trying to listen to everybody from every, every perspective um, and, uh, um, and uh, ultimately we'll be doing a lot of testing with the public either through the tools or through polling and, and that often guides uh, the final decision that we put together a plan that, that uh, the various stakeholders, considering all the other potential initiatives, would support, and that the public has demonstrated that, that we were wise putting that together and two thirds of them would support. So I can't commit to you that 239 will be in the plan. It's, if these folks say it's in the plan, um, it'll be in the plan and we'll work to deliver it. Um, it's my understanding that this is a tri-link project as well. Do we have to wait till San Joaquin and Alameda County uh, step forward with this? Or can we just, can we start that first link? Yeah, we probably need to come back and, and update you on that. Um, uh, we're, not, we're actually in the process of winding up the planning for that stage for that project that's under Martin's leadership and it's in a month or two it's going to transfer over to me. Yeah, I'm okay. the project delivery person. I uh, spent a couple of Fridays ago over in San Joaquin County. Um, it wasn't a yawn from them, but you know, they, they don't view it as benefiting them. So um, ultimately you really, you don't have to have everybody on board, but boy, it sure is hard. <laughs> to tell somebody we're going to build a freeway through your community if they don't like it. So um, the technical answer to your question is no, but the realistic answer is, yeah, we need to have some more consensus building with both Alameda County and San Joaquin County. Um, and whether that turns into funding, I think that's very speculative, whether they would see it enough benefit to actually contribute to funding. So we have a lot of work to do to to gain consensus on that project. And I think you know, clearly huge support in East County. Um, there's other folks uh, that have concerns from an environmental perspective. You know, we have to work through that. Um, getting the other two counties that form the Tri and Tri-Link, we're, we're a ways from that. Well, it, when I talked with Matt Kelly, um, he said that uh, maybe the first link, even though it's just Contra Costa County, might be on the board. I don't know what soon is, uh, where you go from Vasco Road on Armstrong Road mm -hmm. to Byron Tracy Highway. Is that at all have a yes on it? I, I'd have to chat with Matt to find out what he's, okay. he's talking about. That uh, We haven't even started the environmental process yet. Okay. Thank so you. it's uh, uh, the short answer is a number of years. Um, I can't fill in that number. <laughs> okay. 
So at any rate, that uh, ends my uh, presentation. I appreciate the dialogue. I'm glad it was more of a dialogue than a Q&A, and I'd be happy to answer any more questions that you have or continue the dialogue. Russ, I, <clears throat> my, my drum beating is always around bus service, mm -hmm. and I, I served as commissioner for the city of Lafayette. And while I appreciate your hard work, and certainly, Lindsay, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, I think you're going in the right direction and receiving input from various stakeholders. Can you help me understand why our bus service is despicable? And I don't mean that in a in a disrespectful way, it just is, it is. And there's a lot of lip service. I know when I served as commissioner, I got sick and tired of listening to nonsense rhetoric and nothing was being done. So you see, in the, at least in the city of Lafayette, buses up and down, empty, and, and there's so much, um, you know, when we say we're going to be funding bus transportation, no, we're not. We're not doing that at all. It would be a, a push and maybe a strong arm in advertising it and going after the high school kids. I mean, I would think that that would be the audience. We're not doing it. We're certainly not doing that in La Mirinda. There are, there are pockets. But in speaking uh, on what uh, Millard was, was, there are out, outside areas that would benefit from a bus service that would bring people closer to their jobs. Uh, and regardless of the big talk about the next BART strike and how terrible BART is, if there was an earthquake, we can't even get to the next county. You know, let, let alone crossing the bridge, if there is a bridge, to San Francisco. We can't get to Oakland. And what are we waiting for? So we're, we're looking at a 2015 to 2034 vision. And I think that we can, you can point with pride that a lot of that money went to the Caldecott Tunnel. People see it. They experience it. Widening Highway 4, EBART, and that there's still a lot of, as Patricia was saying, well, what about the areas beyond? Um, Antioch, Oakley, Brentwood, and bus service. Yeah, well, um, it's interesting. It's interesting. One of the top six is improved bus service. Now, what I don't know if the people that said to improve bus service are where you are, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not serving the needs right now and it needs to be improved. Or I, I'm sure a large number of people who, who re replied with this said, I like it, I just want it more, more frequent, more, uh, uh, you know, more efficient, because uh, none of us like to see an empty bus riding around. So, so you know, again, that's something that, you know, we need to test as we're talking to the stakeholders to test through through polling you know how many people ha have your your opinion that we shouldn't invest more in buses and, and, and you know there'll be a split on, on that uh, that opinion um, and I, I guess the things we're trying to do about it I know Randy's been holding a, a number of, of discussions with the, the operators in, in the in the county and really trying to push them for technological solutions that allow them to to be more efficient in their operations and there's been you know some uh, uh, varying degrees of, uh, of uh, acceptance to some of that but we have a number of pilots underway now that that uh, really uh, I don't know if it specifically addresses what you're talking about there in, in Lafayette or La Mirinda but trying to have that last mile connection is that last mile connection on a 42 passenger bus, it doesn't necessarily have to be. So, so one of the pilots that we have underway out in, in East County is uh, 
trying to work with someone like Uber or someone like Uber that could take you if you're a BART rider and, and you and however many other people could fit in that car help get you, you know, door to door or close to door to door. So it's that transformation of, you know, transit has to be a 42 passenger or whatever it is bus to are there other ways to deliver that in a more boutique setting. So we're trying to do those kinds of things here. If you don't mind my sure. commenting on that. I, I think it's innovative and I think that's wonderful you know, to, to say Uber. And certainly they can fill that gap. And yet the buses continue to run and continue to receive revenue. So if you're going to pay me to do nothing, I'm going to continue to do nothing. Yeah, it's hard for me to comment on that because I, uh, I think uh, – uh, you know, that's that's an opinion. I respect your opinion. I know there's others that have different opinions. Some people are very reliant on transit and they're very, I don't know, if that, well, some people are very satisfied. Some people think that, you know, you can always be better. So uh, maybe it's just how we're implemented in the county is, is different based on the characteristics of the county. Um, if I could, I, I'm a bus rider, I, I do, so in Pinole, we, it's usually a packed bus, um, but I do agree that if, if something's not working, let's not fund it, <laughs> the same as something that is working. Um, I would just say that it seems to me that, that a lot of times those empty buses do damage the roads, yeah. and they do, especially on residential roads, and so that's a cost that we're incurring for something that, so not only are we paying but we're also incurring a damage cost to repair those roads for, you know, those heavy-duty buses. So, I mean, is there uh, anything being done to address that as far as stats-wise? I mean, what numbers are out there uh, that say, yes, ridership is up or ridership's down, and so we hold ourselves accountable or hold them accountable to the money that we're giving them? Yeah, I, well, I, the answer is yes. I can't tell you um, what they are necessarily say I know where to find them, but yeah, all that data is available. Transit properties are, you know, one of the things that they're awash in is, is reporting. They report more than any agency, I, government agency I know. They have myriads of reports. So we could, uh, that's actually a good suggestion. We should be bringing in that kind of efficiency information. Um, but again, it, 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 I'm up here preaching promises made, promises kept. If that's an area where the promise isn't being met, um, yeah, we need to, to hold them accountable. Now, transit is highly regulated too. So so that's that's something that I think we all could be working on as well is to, uh, I don't want to say good regulation, bad regulation, but you know there are a lot of regulations that you scratch your head and go, why is that in place? Is that just because something happened back in 1964 and we're not going to, something bad happened, so we enacted a regulation that never comes off the books. We're, we're full of that kind of stuff. So um, it's a, a, that's a good suggestion, and I think it's something we need to bring in. Is, uh, and, and I know the transit folks report that stuff over and over and over. And I know they're going to be here with their hat in hand. So uh, uh, having uh, increased accountability is a good suggestion. I have a comment to address to that. Why are we stuck with a 42-passenger bus? Um, my belief is we're not. Well, but that's what it looks like. Yeah. And if in San Francisco back in the 60s they tried using smaller coaches on the hill, some of the hills, they were very successful and lasted about a year, and then they quit doing it. Um, you know, it's something that, to me that is, a, is an efficiency that we could, instead of instead of a 42 passenger coach running empty, maybe you got a 20 passenger coach running with three people in, and it's your your yeah. economics are way different. Yeah, well, there's, there's I mean, yeah, you know, probably beyond my level of expertise here, but I know that there there's economy and buying the equipment when it's relatively standardized, so you have that. Um, but again, back to what we're doing, uh, another pilot project that we have under, underway with Genie out in Tri-Delta is dynamic routing. So a route that works at 8 o'clock in the morning might not be the best route that works at 11 o'clock in the morning. So 
we're, we're going to work through an app. Um, this we're, we're developing it with a path over at Berkeley um, to to have people say, I want a bus and a bus to find those people and basically tell them, why don't you and three other people that you don't know, but they're walking around doing the same thing, go to this corner and we'll pick you up. Um, so, you know, we got to deal with other issues there about, you know, safe bus stops and all that kind of stuff. I, I take that Tri-Delta Transit and they, they are on it. You can hear them on the radio and, and it is working. They don't always take the same route all the time. If there's a jam up on Highway 4, which is a lot of times, they'll take the side streets and, and move around that way. But they are limited on uh, uh, simply because of logistics and the size of the vehicle and where they can and can't go. Yeah, we're, we're, we recognize that there's this need for some paradigm shift in all this. And, you know, so we're trying to push that through, through technology. But uh, you know, we've had the same discussions about smaller buses. So uh, some of that's just economy and, you know, them buying their fleets. But. Um, building off of Anthony's comments, you know, one of the principles for a new transportation expenditure plan is accountability. And, you know, the CCTA will continue its commitment to accountability and transparency. And so I'm kind of curious how we're going to be implementing accountability in our new transportation expansion plan. Because uh, if, if what, um, Yolanda is saying that, um, you know, the bus is up in La Marina. I know she's been saying this quite often. If there, she keeps consistently saying that the buses up there are using public funds but are not um, performing, and they are not, in her opinion, not being held accountable for that. I'm kind of curious how we're going to incorporate this concept of accountability in our new transportation expenditure plan. Well, maybe you can help with that because the last item on your agenda, the growth management checklist, that's a form of accountability that was built in for jurisdictions adhering to certain policies. So maybe that discussion should be happening with, with transit or, or other things that we invest in. So I don't know the answer to your question, but uh, uh, certainly that if there's a significant enough uh, concern that funds are not being spent efficient, efficiently, um, Maybe there is a process that anyone who gets funds has to go through a similar type type checklist. Um, you know, my background again is is more on on project delivery, and I see a, a number of jurisdictions that are getting appropriations of money and you know for a variety of projects, and they're not being delivered. So should we be giving them more money? Um, we had a gentleman here from a bike coalition a few few meetings ago that made that statement and. Our board didn't like what they're hearing because we think we deliver well, but not everybody does. So, um, uh, today's world accountability is is higher than it's ever been. Um, a lot of other counties have empowered their uh, citizen advisory committee to be to have more of a watchdog type of uh, role. Um, so, certainly open to that discussion. Um, again, I. I don't know the level of sentiment about this topic throughout the county, but it's uh, there's enough concern around the dais here. It's it's worth a, a discussion. So uh, we need to find a way to work that into our dialogue, whether it's you know through the uh, EPAC group or or with the direct engagement with the public, because uh, often in the public agency side everything's fine. You know, I just need more. Any further questions or comments by members of the committee? Well, thank you very much for uh, bringing us up to date on this. Sure. All right. Congratulations. Chair, your elections. Thank you, Chair Lee. And uh, we'll be back. Don't doubt it. Hmm? As long as Brian buys those chips, I'll come to the meeting. <laughs> Okay, pass on to reports. You have my report from the authority board meeting of uh, last week. Of course, the major part of that board meeting was working on uh, what uh, Ross has just presented to us. 
I uh, am trying to hit the highlights of the consent calendar. The only other regular agenda items were two financial. I, uh, you know, being a fire board member, I certainly wish we could do what the authority is going to do, which is uh, with a, a single $2 million plus expenditure, eliminate their unfunded liability to the Retirement Association or to CalPERS, which they work with for their employees. And the other was uh, the bonds that were marketed in uh, 2012, the revenue bonds that uh, also was mentioned as a way of leveraging the sales tax funding only had a three year life so they have to be refunded. They're going to try to be somewhat opportunistic as to the timing. They got the authorization, but they didn't name a timing. I believe the 2012 bonds, they absolutely bottom tipped interest rates. The interest rate was higher the day before and the day after they issued their bonds. So we have a very alert and uh, opportunistic finance staff at the authority to try to just get the best deal the authority can with these things. If you want to have some idea of how broadly uh, Randy's contacts are, Take a look at the executive director's comments, which always appears toward the end of the authority board meeting agenda. I, I don't even begin to touch on half of what he does. Um, the main mention, the main thing that I got from his presentation, we've been having uh, construction problems out on the Highway 4 East widening project. It really slowed things down. They're trying very hard to get that last segment, have the median done and available to EBART by February of 2016, so as not to impact EBART's uh, construction. So they're putting a lot of time and effort in on that, uh, a lot of 10 hour days, six day weeks on the part of the contractor. That's really all I have to say about the authority board meeting, unless there are any questions. Okay, we uh, pass on to uh, member and staff comments. Chair Smith, I, there are various um, new members that are sitting on this committee, and I would like to ask for an agendized item and in a future meeting that we are able to introduce ourselves and give a very short, brief background on who we are so that we can um, better collaborate with each other. That's an excellent idea. And uh, will you take care of that, Diane? Thank you. Also, uh, our report this afternoon or this evening from the city of El Cerrito spoke about a transportation complete street report that they're going to uh, think have uh, at in a few months, I, I believe. I would like to also ask if we can agendize that and have them come back and give us a, a report on where that particular status is on their transportation and complete street. Well, we'll certainly put that down as a uh, future agenda item. And are there uh, any other suggestions? Yes. <laughs> and last, lastly, uh, there are certain responsibilities we have as committee members, and there are certain restrictions that we have as committee members. And I would like, again, agendized uh, in a future meeting for that partic those particular responsibilities that we have as committee members to be outlined to us. Number one, as a refresher for those of us who've been sitting on this committee for a while, 
but certainly for our newer members so they can hear what how we uh, interface with the transportation authority and that in fact we're an advisory only an advisory board mm -hmm. so if we could have that also agendized please I would assume that would be something that uh, Martin could come and uh, do with us. All right, thank you. Sure, I just one quick question for uh, Diane. Um, just wondering, um, from your perspective, how much effort are the city councils of the communities that where we currently don't have representatives working to try to find, uh, you know, folks from their communities to join this uh, this committee? Because looking at you know, for example, the two most populous cities in the county, Concord and Richmond, currently don't have members on the committee. I'm, I'm just wondering what, you know, what, I don't know what you can do in terms of uh, urging those city councils to um, make the appointments. I've been, I've been playing with uh, Enlighten, um, and, and I used it, and I, I, I'm not sure I found a real reasonable use for it other than to get your attention to stop texting. So I, I, I played with it. It worked great. I loved the little ding, and I looked up, and the light turns green, and there's still somebody <laughs> sitting there waiting to go. So, but I, to me, it ended up being a distraction. And I just kind of killed it because through experience, I know when the light's going to turn green. I'm not sure what the use would be except that this could be testing for other purposes. So uh, I don't recommend anybody rely on it. <laughs> I'd go through it and listen to it and go, oh, gee whiz, that works cool. <laughs> don't know what it's for, but... Uh, just tells me when to go and when I can't step on the gas or better yet to step on the gas harder and try to make it through that uh, yellow light. Uh, I'm sorry, it was just a fun thing to play with and I was always curious about these things and so I had to have it and it lasted for two runs and I said, eh. I, I had the same experience with, with that. Um, I would just like to... Um, Remind, I guess, I guess it'd be Lindsay, but I think we had a um, an offer to take a tour of the Gomentum um, facility at some point. I just want to make sure we don't forget that, and I'd love to see that. I was very impressed with the presentation last month. So. Anything further? Any further suggestions for the agenda? Not a. I would. I, I'd like to thank Yolanda for her suggestion for us newcomers. It will be greatly appreciated to know a little more about what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay. And who we are. And, and who we are yes. Thank you. Depending on uh, what we have uh, scheduled for the next meeting, we might combine both of those suggestions, a discussion, you know, a round of introductions and a discussion of the roles and responsibilities of the committee if we don't have a real backlog of uh, checklists. I think we seem to be slowing down on the checklists. If there's nothing else, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'd like to um, congratulate both the chair and the uh, vice chair. And uh, I would like to add to what uh, Yolanda said. Um, I, I would just like to see a follow-up um, 
on some of the requests that we make about information, um, make sure that that information come back because a lot of it is not to try to dictate, but to try to um, figure out a way to help our cities do better than what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If we have nothing further, I'll declare us adjourned. <laughs>